uh, last substantive session of the day. I hope you enjoyed Anat's brilliant keynote earlier and the breakout sessions that I think you are all just in. For those of you just joining us, I'm Gabby Goldstein. I'm one of our co-founders here at Sister District and our political director. And so today to close out the substantive programming, it is my absolute delight and pleasure to moderate a panel discussion with three of our distinguished Sister District alums. We have Senator Faith Winter from Colorado, Representative Ricky Hurtado from North Carolina and Representative Regina Lewis Ward from Georgia. So as just a quick agenda for what we're going to run through today, uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about our new alumni program at the top. And then I'll ask each of our panelists to kick us off by spending a couple minutes introducing themselves. And then we will dive into a panel discussion about their experiences in the legislature, accomplishments, and priorities during this very strange one of a kind, hopefully, session, legislative session. And we'll try for Q&A. Uh, please do put your questions into the chat. Uh, my apologies if we aren't able to get to everyone's questions, but we will do our best to, uh, to run through those. So let me just take this opportunity to tell you all a little bit about our alumni program. Um, as some of you may know, I am uh, soon going to be shifting over from my current role to lead our C4 and build out some new programs. And one that I'm extremely excited about is our Purple District Network, which is our alumni program. So Sister District ended 2020 with an incredible alumni community of 48 sitting legislators in 14 different states. And one thing that these folks all share in common is that they now represent purple districts, meaning they flipped seats red to blue or are otherwise in fragile blue seats. And so this creates a shared opportunity, a shared experience that opens the door to build a community and resources specifically for legislators in this purple district context. So it's a little bit different uh, than other programs that exist for um, legislators in other contexts. This is a, a niche that we can uniquely um, fill. So that's what this network does. It builds community between these fantastic purple district legislators and allows for skills sharing, resources, best practices, governance techniques, and strategies for being effective. And this is especially important for our divided government and red trifecta legislators um, who can really learn from each other about how to be effective uh, in the face of those political contexts. So our programming includes a shared database of contact information for all of our participants, convenings by Zoom for now, uh, for cohorts of folks, including our new legislators cohort, and we are working on our first ever annual alumni summit for later this year. So hopefully you're all as amped about our alumni program as I am. As you heard in our strategy session earlier today, Sister District is really working to fill gaps at every phase of the political life cycle. And so that includes helping great folks get elected and then building community and setting them up for success once they are elected. And with that, it is my pleasure to dive into the panel discussion. Let's kick things off by having our panelists introduce themselves, say a little bit about their district, when they were elected, and why they ran. Um, and so let's just go in alphabetical order. So that would be Representative Hurtado, and then Representative Lewis Ward, and then Senator Winter. Thank you so much. Hey, good afternoon, folks. Representative Ricky Hurtado here. It's great to see so many uh, of the volunteers that supported the campaign on this uh, great event today. Shout out to Sister District for all y'all did to to help me get to this point. Um, like Gabby mentioned, I'm in House District 63 in Alamance County. Uh, I am representing now a purple district or a, a left leaning district in a sea of red. Uh, the rest of our races in Alamance County went, you know, shifted right pretty dramatically this election. We have a five zero county commissioners, um, a pretty evenly split school board. And so um, certainly sort of the lone person standing after a tough, tough election here in North Carolina. Uh, but that's part of what motivated me to run. I um, 
have said throughout the campaign and continue to say that those closest to the problem are closest to the solution and felt that so many of the populations and, and groups that I represent, young people, uh, Latinos, immigrants, um, folks who truly have lived experiences and have a lot to share in the political scene have been left out of the process. And so that's really what kickstarted my campaign and, and what's got me here to the legislature here in North Carolina now. So I'm excited to share some of my experiences and, and continue connecting with y'all. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Gabby, and all of the sister district um, volunteers for this um, wonderful event this afternoon. I am Regina Lewis Ward, and I am state rep for Georgia's 109th district. That district is a suburb of um, Atlanta, and it actually covers three counties. And I was just elected um, this past November. So yay to all the work that everyone did to help me get to that, to that, um, to this place. So this district was um, held by a Republican for the past 16 years, and we saw it trending um, out of the red zone into the purple zone. And I thought that the voters needed to have someone who listens to them and someone who was really active in the community and not just um, holding a seat. So I, um, I understand that people are hurting here and they need a representative, someone who can actually speak for them and represent them. So I started to give them, I decided to give them a voice in, um, in selecting who their representative would be. And um, I ran in 2018, I came very close and I decided to come back out in 2020 and run again. And I was successful the second time that I ran. And um, I'm, I'm really excited about being here this afternoon and sharing my experiences um, that I've had in the legislature for the last three weeks with you guys. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Faith Winter. I'm a senator in Colorado, and I would not have the title senator if it wasn't for the work the sister district did. So thank you for all the work the sister district did. Um, I have been elected since 2007. I was first a city councilor and the mayor pro tem and state representative. And in 2018, I was in the most competitive race in the country uh, for state senate named both by the DLCC and the RLCC. Um, so it was a really hard race and sister district really came through. And I am a state senator because in my heart of hearts, I'm an organizer. And every single day I wake up and build power through people. And that means organizing folks, inspiring folks and getting more people to run for office. Um, and so I've been an organizer since 2004. And that's what I do. I get up every day and build power through people regardless of my title. Uh, and that's why I'm here today. And I'm excited to share more about that. Incredible. We are so grateful to each of you for running, for your service. I truly an inspiration and just quest all the love in the chat is is such such proof of, of our immense uh, what treasures you are to, to all of our teams. So let's talk a little bit about experiences in the legislature. Ricky and Regina, you are both new this year, and I'm sure it has been a year like no other, although it is your first, so uh, not yet a point of comparison, but I'm so curious, what has it been like for you to transition from campaign world into being a legislator? What has that been like, Ricky and, and then Regina? Yeah, of course. Uh, great question. I, I saw a uh, Instagram post last night from President Joe Biden that said uh, second week done or something like that. And I was like, my God, really second week? It's felt like the second year already, right? And so that's how time has felt in January for me as well. I'm, I'm really on the third uh, week on the job real, realistically. And I think one of, there's two things that, that come to mind when you ask that question. One is sort of the transition uh, in, in adjusting our mindset in North Carolina, right? When I was campaigning, when, when Democrats were campaigning, it, you know, we had a vision of what North Carolina could be, right? So I felt like we were really on the offense because there was a real opportunity to take back the majority. Um, unfortunately, we know that elections didn't go quite the way you wanted to uh, at the state level here in North Carolina. And so we've had to really adjust expectations and mindset, right? From offense to defense, right? Thankfully, we're able to hold on to Governor Cooper's veto. And so we certainly still have a voice 
and a battle in front of us in North Carolina. But, but the calculation is, is certainly different than uh, a few months ago when we were uh, gearing up for, for election day. Uh, and I think the, the other part for me too is, is um, like faith, I think organizing is at the heart of everything I do and really building power through people. Uh, and at least these first few weeks, uh, I feel like communication engagement has really gone from the grassroots to the grass tops, right? Like if I don't get good control of my calendar any given day, right? From 8.30 to 6, it is filled with 15, 20 minute meetings with lobbyists and with other groups that are in my office sort of beating everyone else to the punch to sort of talk about the issues that, that they care about. Obviously, you know, in some respects, important to the political process, but sort of the engagement that I, I had on the campaign where it was, I was driving communication to the grassroots. Now it feels like everyone else is driving communication my way. And so I'm really, after a few weeks in the General Assembly, really trying to find a balance and how do I make sure that the community that sent me to represent them is fully informed of the, of the legislative process and how do I take them along in the journey? It's a lot harder than I anticipated given my mighty staff of one <laughs> and, and, and sort of a limited uh, communication sort of support to be able to really do that on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that's what I'm, what's on my mind for the next few weeks to make sure that I don't lose sight of, of why I went to Raleigh. Good. Um, thank you so much. And I have to echo, echo two of the things that um, Representative um, Ricky mentioned, trying to find that balance the balance between what happens at the Capitol and also when you come back home. Because you don't wanna come back home so drained that you can't, you don't feel like having dinner or you don't feel like having a conversation with those who, who are in your house. And, and for me, I don't think anyone or anything could have prepared me for the transition going down to the Capitol to do the work. We are seated because of the pandemic, we are seated in three different locations so yeah, trying to find that um, partner or colleague that you want to have that conversation with sometimes is, is really difficult because if I'm on the fourth floor, by the time I get down to the second floor, they're already gone. And so that meeting may not, may not happen. Another thing for me, information comes at me from various sources. I'll get text messages. I'll get things in my email. They even find an email that I don't even use anymore. And I still get information into to that email, um, phone calls, letters, and we try to respond um, to everything so that you won't be flagged as that representative who, who doesn't get back to the constituents. Um, but for me, the main thing is that it became a reality when I went down to the Capitol. I saw how necessary it is to flip the additional 15 seats that we need. You know, while we're campaigning, we'll say, oh yeah, we need 16 seats to have a majority. But the reality is it makes a difference because the majority party, they don't have any rules. They do exactly what they wanna do, whether it makes sense or not. And to give you an example, one of the committees that I sit on, I sit on the agriculture committee. It has 27 members on the committee, 21, of those members are Republicans and seven are Democrats. So that's a lopsided committee. And believe it or not, they voted recently to a quorum for 28 members would be six people present. That's hardly a quorum, six people out of 28 members. And it's nothing you can do because you don't have the vote to, to make a change. So it's really, really important to, to have a majority to flip the next 15 seats that we need in the, in the Georgia House so that we can get some work done that um, we need to get done for our people. Thank you thousand, for the question. Absolutely. And Regina, I just want to shout out the Regina Report, which is, I think, one of the best constituent newsletters that I have seen from a legislator that you are putting out on, I think, is it weekly? And it is it's chock full of information and it with such an approachable uh, tone and, um, and, and just so informative and perfect. So huge shout out to the Regina Report. Thank you. Um, Thank you. But, you know, it's a really great point about the majority and what a difference it makes. And Faith, you, we're in the Colorado House when Democrats did not have the majority. And then 
your seat flipping uh, helped deliver the democratic trifecta in, in Colorado. And so you've seen it on both sides. I would love your thoughts about um, what it was like to go from the minority to the majority and what, it, what, what the real power is being in the majority. So there's definitely real power, but I know that there's a lot of folks that aren't in the majority. And I worked really hard for a lot of years, both um, I started my city council career in the minority, and then I started my state house career in the minority before we got the trifecta in Colorado. And um, I worked on really big issues. Probably most of what I'm well known for is paid family leave and climate change. And I would lose those bills, but I called it losing forward, right? So every time I ran paid family leave, I would get a bigger coalition, more media coverage and win over hearts and minds and find more people to tell their stories about why they cared so much about it. And so for anyone on this call that doesn't have a trifecta and isn't in the majority in the House, the Senate and the governor's office, know that losing forward actually sets you up for future success, which then I got to cash in once I flipped the Colorado Senate. Um, so there was five of us that were running and we were all women. We called ourselves the Fab Five and four out of five of us had to win in order to flip the Senate and all of us won. And wow. the change that happened was that meant we passed one of the most groundbreaking climate change bills in the country. We passed one of the most groundbreaking equal pay bills in the country because of what we did. We passed an increased minimum wage, which is one of the highest in the countries because of what we did. We've increased education funding. And so we went from overnight to not being able to do things, but the groundwork we had done when we were in the minority, because we had coalitions that were ready to go. We had messaging that was ready to go. We had policies that were ready to go. So even if you aren't in a state that doesn't have a trifecta, the work you're doing right now really, really matters because when you get there and when you win and when you flip seats, you have to be the adults in the room that are prepared to govern. And we were ready to do that. I, I love that so much. You know, we were just in a session with Anat Shankar Asario, who is an incredible messaging expert. And she talked to us about how we all as progressives need to talk about what we're for and not just what we're against. And hearing your successes, Senator Winter, is exactly the message of that, right? These are the things that we're for. And it's so important that you mention laying the groundwork and, and losing forward, uh, because that's, that's something that we've seen in other states where we worked, including Virginia, where uh, early in their trifecta, um, progressive legislators introduced bills that didn't go anywhere and now are being able to be passed. Virginia just uh, is abolishing the death penalty, for instance. And it took years and years of introducing the same legislation year after year after year and not having it pass to, to build that groundwork to, to, um, and set that foundation. And so um, it's incredibly powerful to hear the, the stories that you're sharing about how that actually works in practice. And so another question for you, for, for each of you is, when you look at the, the composition of your chambers and your own life trajectories and your stories, each of you is helping us build a more reflective and inclusive democracy. And so I'm so curious what that means to you. What, what representation in the legislature and in politics means to you and why it's so important? So perhaps we can go alphabetically again from Ricky to Regina to Faith. Great, great. Yeah, I love this question. I mean, I think it's everything for me and I think it's everything for uh, the state of North Carolina when we think about, in particular, I think what what my election has meant for so many people. And I'm still sort of grappling with that reality, right, to sort of be launched into uh, the spotlight um, and, and really feel like um, a lot of folks are watching um, how this, you know, campaign to now sort of elected official sort of journey pans out. 
we have in North Carolina over a million Latinos and Spanish speaking folks. Uh, and, we, and I am currently the lone Latino legislator in the General Assembly. And so the amount of media appearances that I've made in the last three months has been pretty remarkable. And I, I really cherish these opportunities because there's unprecedented attention and engagement with what's happening at the state level. People are really interested. They're like, what is Ricky doing, right? Like, what are the bills they're talking about? And it's also been an education journey for folks who, was, who weren't quite sure what the House and Senate did in North Carolina. And so I, I love that opportunity because I'm, and I'm already hearing whispers, right? Of just like, oh, well, maybe I can do this too, right? And so I'm really curious to see who else runs in 2022. I think it's the same thing for, for young people. My very first email in my legislative uh, account was from two 16 year old students in, uh, in our local high school who were really excited to see someone like me run who wanted to propose a bill, some legislation that they wanted to talk about. I love that, right? And so that was a great opportunity. Um, and I think on the more somber note, I think that you know my campaign very much centered the the plight and challenges of, of working class folks in North Carolina, especially in Alamance County. And people are, are, are hurting a lot right now, especially in my county, uh, as we continue to navigate COVID-19. And so the reality that people felt like they finally had an advocate and the number of emails and cases we've taken on around fighting housing evictions, even though it's illegal with the moratorium and folks navigating the unemployment system, uh, the fact that people in my district felt like they didn't have someone else that would fight for them, and now all of a sudden say, at least I feel seen, I think I think has been a very humbling sort of few weeks to, to be in that position to see what we can do as far as constituent services go. And so, yeah, representation absolutely matters. And I think those are a few of the reasons why. Um, I think for me, representation means that now I have um, a responsibility to to listen to uh, my constituents, to to know what keeps the mothers and the and the fathers up at night, what their conversations are like around their kitchen table, what really concerns them, and then take that information and try to make it better across the board for everyone through proposing and drafting different legislation. Um, I think that I represent um, something that this district has not had before, um, which is an African American uh, woman um, who's actually sitting in this seat, listening, um, helping to make everyone's life better. And I know that that is a, it's a heavy lift. And um, hopefully I can represent well and um, continue to listen and continue to hear and see what's on the minds and hearts of those in, in the particular district. So thank you. Um, look, we are going to solve the problems of our country and our states and our cities without diverse representation. And we know that when we get more diverse representation, we actually change the solutions we have. Um, so when I'm not being a state senator, I actually recruit and train women to run for office, and I train progressive elected officials to govern. Um, but when I was first elected to city council, we were interviewing people to be on boards and commissions. And there was this really fantastic lawyer who should be on our planning board, and she was very qualified. Uh, and she was clearly pregnant when she came in for her interview. And what my city council didn't know was that I had recently become pregnant, but it's that time when you don't tell anyone. And so I had both my children in office and they now door knock for me and do fundraising speeches for me, which is amazing. Um, but I was first pregnant and not telling anyone and some old white guys on my council said, well, I don't think we should put this woman on the planning commission because she's pregnant and she's not gonna have time. And I looked at them and I said, you know what? Women can actually use their brains and their uterus at the same time, turns out. Um, and she ended up being elected, but if there hadn't been, I was the first person to give birth in office in city council. I was younger. Everyone else on city council could have been my parent or grandparent. Um, and if I hadn't been at the table, that wouldn't have been discussed. 
And there's so many rooms and times that if we don't have diversity of gender, of race, of class, of uh, the GLBTQ community, we're not gonna actually find the solutions we need, right? Who better to look at foreclosure policy than someone that's gone through a foreclosure? Who better to look at eviction policies than anyone that's fought eviction in court? And that's not me, I'm a suburban mom, right? But I bring my suburban momness to the table and I need everyone else to bring their authentic selves to the table. And that's why I work continually to make sure we are recruiting diverse people to democracy because we won't have a strong democracy without diversity. A thousand million percent. Completely agree. And your own experiences are such uh, vibrant reminders to all of us about how that works in practice. And, um, you know, Faith, I know that you have been so active in paid family uh, leave and issues facing working parents and working people and, um, and your own experiences shine through there as well. And so uh, incredibly grateful. And so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about this session. Obviously, this is a session like no other uh, with, of course, the pandemic. Um, I, I know that in various state legislatures, uh, sessions are being held remotely or being held in alternative venues. Um, certainly the insurrections earlier this month uh, were, there were reverberations in state capitals um, all over the country. And so we'd love to get a sense from each of you about how session is going. Of course, Ricky and Regina, you're new. So um, this is your first session and it's such a strange one, I'm sure. Um, but would love your perspective on, um, you know, on how it's going. So let's just go around again um, alphabetically to Ricky, Regina and Faith. <laughs> Sorry, do dog here. <laughs> um, yeah, I yeah, it is it is my first few weeks in the legislature, but I would say that uh, you know you can you can tell from previous sessions that that it is certainly different, right? I think the biggest challenge is is, is the necessary precautions that were taken due to COVID nineteen. It's really made right like things that folks don't talk about, right? Relationships are at the heart of everything you do in in politics, right? And it's a lot harder when you don't see people. And so you're having some folks vote via proxy committee meetings. Some folks are on WebEx and some people are in person and all the conversations that you're used to having in the hallways or uh, to get to know people, right? Uh, see people eating lunch together, like all those things that I feel like opens opportunities for, for freshmen legislators in particular to learn who's introducing what legislation to sort of see where the directions and trends are with certain things to get to know folks. Um, none of that exists now because of COVID-19. And so it's, it's actually created uh, a lot of obstacles that, that weren't necessarily apparent at the front end for these first few weeks in session. So I think, I think that's the biggest thing. And I, and I think, like you said, right, the other cloud hanging over our nation currently um, still, right, is, is, is sort of how we began the year with an insurrection and and i and i think it's that sort of behavior and climate very much exists in my district um being a district where at the heart at our county seat and in my district is a confederate monument and been having a clash between black lives matter protesters and white nationalists for going on a year now and so that sort of energy it, it, you know goes beyond just you know, just theoretical, right? It's it's now it's it's weighing decisions around how close to home do you want this to hit, right? If you're incredibly vocal about what's happening, you all of a sudden have a pretty big target on your back, right? And that's just sort of being real transparent about fear and safety and security, right? Uh, and, and what that means for your family and what it means to go, you know, grab lunch next to the Confederate monument. And so those are the sorts of things that I've been grappling these last few weeks because it, it is no longer theoretical, right? It is it is things that are happening in your backyard and, and things that you have to weigh every week as you 
continue to to fight for the community's values and, and for what you believe in and and the vision that that, that you have for for North Carolina. I really envy the legislators who are able to cast their ballot, cast their votes from home. All of our voting is done in person at the Capitol. We, we are separated um, in three different locations, but everyone is at the Capitol. Unfortunately, we don't have remote voting yet. And that's something I would really like to have, you know, at this particular time. Um, so yeah, and in Georgia State Capitol, it's I guess it's the same with the pandemic scare that everyone else has. Uh, we are tested twice a week, every Monday and every Thursday. It's required that we um, take a COVID test um, that they provide um, for us. Um, and, and I would have to agree, the, getting the relationships um, going is, is kind of difficult because we're all spread out. Uh, but despite the fact that we're spread out and, and we have the pandemic hanging over our head, I was able to introduce um, two pieces of legislation. Um, one is um, a revision of a current statute that will um, allow um, employees to use their sick leave for immediate family members. And the other is um, that the cities and municipalities have to provide notification public notifications of um, environmental studies about how it will impact the particular, particular community. Um, and I co-signed on some other bills that will be in my report this week, but um, work is still getting done. <laughs> work is still getting done. Um, yeah, and, and hopefully next session, uh, we'll be able to sit together and, and have those lunches and dinners as everyone is telling us that we're missing right now. Um, it's, it's really weird right now. Uh, and it's interesting because actually when I was on city council, we did safety trainings routinely about what would happen if there was an active shooter, but we never did that as a state legislator. And it's something that I've asked to do. And we did finally do it after the insurrection. And so being told about how there's tunnels that we would be escorted to and taken off site. Uh, we had to wear lanyards so that our state patrol, as they said, would just start grabbing us if something happened. Um, and so that was really scary. And the day before I went back into session, my daughter, it was 9.15 at night. I have a nine-year-old daughter, her name's Sienna, and she was in tears and she didn't want me to go to session. And that's the real sacrifice that legislators give. And um, so I called up the head of my state patrol. I actually texted him and said, are you up? And his name is Sergeant Mike Hahn and he's an amazing person. He said, I am up. And he has a nine-year-old daughter as well and a seven-year-old. I said, I can't calm my nine-year-old down. Will you talk to her? And so the day before I went back into session, because this was the week before inauguration, the insurrection had just happened and it was all over the news. The head of my state patrol called up my nine-year-old daughter and talked to her about how he would keep her safe. And that was the decisions we were making. Every woman legislator I talked to that week that was going back into session was talking about wearing flats to run faster or wear an outfit where she had pockets to carry mace. And that's what your elected officials are looking at going into right now. We went back and it was an incredibly boring three-day session and I was so happy it was boring. I passed two bills. I passed uh, millions of dollars to help small businesses. I made sure that debt collectors weren't taking unfair advantage of folks. And we're going back full time on the 16th. And in Colorado, we are lucky because uh, we do have a lot of vaccines and legislators for the continuation of government have gotten vaccines. So I got my second vaccine day, today. Um, <clears throat> and we get tested on a daily basis. So both on the safety 
and COVID, it's the weirdest time I've ever been elected in my 15 years of being elected. Faith, I, you know, and Regina and Ricky, the, the bravery and the fortitude that each of you have during this time is absolutely staggering and inspirational to us. And we are so grateful for your service always, but particularly in this really critical and as you said, weird period of time. Um, it, we, 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 are, we are a grateful nation um, and we stand with you. Um, switching gears a little bit, I know that we have a lot of folks who are really interested in redistricting. And I would be curious for your perspectives about how redistricting works in your states and what you expect to happen. And perhaps we can go in reverse alphabetical order this time. So Faith, Regina, and then Ricky. Sure. Um, so redistricting is really interesting. We actually passed two referendums in Colorado. So Colorado is a ballot initiative state we like passing ballot initiatives and we passed two that created some non-redistricting commissions. So both in 2000, 2010, there was lawsuits and the Colorado Supreme Court ultimately weighed in on what districts looked like. And then the legislature referred measures X and Y, I think, um, to the voters and they passed. So now we have some non, we have nonpartisan redistricting commissions that will set our new maps. However, I think it's super restrictive. So it takes at least 21 days of unpaid work to serve on this commission, which means it's favoring older white folks that are retired and, have, and don't need income. And that's a problem. So we've been working really hard to make sure that there's a diversity of folks on these commissions. The commission has to look at com keeping communities whole. They have to look at communities of color. They have to look at disproportionately impacted communities, but we're already behind schedule, which means I think we're gonna be behind schedule the whole time and we don't know when maps are coming out. So I applaud Colorado for looking at a nonpartisan version of how to do this. And we don't quite have it right yet. So as you know, Gabby, this will be my first experience with um, redistricting. And overall, the one thing that I hope to get out of this is that my district remains the same. <laughs> that, <laughs> um, and, and what I understand is after we um, adjourn the session, they'll convene a special session in the summer to, to look at the, um, the maps. So in, in Georgia, the majority party will draw the lines or make the suggestions and the minority party will have some input. How much is yet to be seen? Yeah, so that, that's really, you know, it for, for as far as what I know. We don't have a commission. Um, I know that we were trying to get one started, but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for us here in North Carolina, it's a similar process. Um, the majority party in the legislature controls the process. In North Carolina over the last 10 years, it's been a number of lawsuits because of the quote unquote surgical position to target African-American voters, um, how that was used to really uh, illegally racially gerrymander our districts. And so my district was actually one that had to be redrawn in 2019 which was why it became so much more competitive and open to flipping from, from red to blue. Uh, you know, we, quite frankly, right, we were seeing emboldened Republicans in a state like North Carolina who had their corrupt practices validated at the ballot box, unfortunately. And so we're seeing a tough redistricting battle in 2020 where we did have a greater level of transparency in 2019 uh, because of the court cases. And so there was much more democratic input uh, from the minority party uh, and much more transparency through a public comment process. Uh, we'll see what we get this year. Um, we're hoping for at least 
now with renewed um, understanding of how this process worked by the public, hopefully putting enough pressure to where we can increase the transparency in that process. Um, but we're certainly not holding our breaths for favors right now. Um, I, I think that, you know, in North Carolina, you know, it's one of the redistricting is one of the things where the governor, you know, his veto does not matter. So even though we have a veto, uh, it's really driven by, by the majority party. And so we will see where, where things pan out. Um, my district is, you know, one of those ones where it might go backwards in terms of um, competitiveness, but, you know, we're, we're going to keep fighting hard and, and regardless of, of what things, how things pan out, we're going to, you know, keep fighting for, for what people put me in office for and where North Carolina needs to go. So we won't, we won't back down by any means. Definitely. And earlier today, we had a deep dive into our 21-22 electoral strategy and, um, and, and all three of your states are on, on our map. And one of the things that we talked about was the fact that redistricting is a mixed bag for us. And in some places, we have the opportunity to go on offense. And in some places, we have to be ready to go on defense. And, um, and both are going to be uh, critical to ensure that we are able to leverage every opportunity we can on offense, um, but also protect and, in, and make sure that incumbent protection uh, is a big part of our strategy. We've always endorsed fragile incumbents here at Sister District, but we definitely foresee the need to um, uh, continue to have that be a, a part of the project uh, as we look at, at the various places where redistricting will, will shake out in different ways. So um, one last question before we, we go to some Q&A. Um, a little, you know, maybe lighthearted, may, whatever comes to mind. I'm curious if there's anything surprising or interesting about being a state legislator um, or, in, or joining your, your, your state legislature that you didn't know before you became one. Um, so maybe we can just mix it up and uh, Regina, Faith, and then Ricky. Let's see. Um, something that's interesting. Hmm. Well, I think all of it is interesting. Um, oh, God. Anything surprising? Um, was it was it or what was it like to to um, you know be there for the first time? Was there uh, anything that you um, uh, saw or encountered that um, took you by surprise or that you thought was huh? That's I didn't know it worked like that. Yes. Okay. So there are so many side conversations going on during the session, and that really took me by surprise. I was like, what is everybody doing? Um, so right at, right after the, the roll call and the Pledge of Allegiance and the um, chaplain for the day speaks, it's like everyone just gets into a side conversation. Everyone's walking around just chatting and often you'll hear the speaker say, you know, will the house come to order? And that's what he means because everyone is doing their own thing. And that was really surprising to me. I guess I had it in my mind you know, I'm, I'm an instructor. And so everyone sits and listens to the instructor. That's not the way it happens <laughs> at all. So yeah, that was surprising for me. Faith, anything come to um, mind? So at the, at the Colorado Capitol, you're allowed to take your dog if you are elected. So I, my dog Queso is famous. He's been in a couple news articles um, and everyone calls him Senator Queso. So I get to take my dog um, and my friend Carrie Donovan, who is currently running in for Congress, which we should all care about because she's running against the crazy Lauren Boebert person that carries guns around. Um, so Carrie Donovan and I shared an office and she'd bring her Don Gary and I'd bring Queso and they're best friends. So Gary and Queso are best friends, um, which is good, but it's just, it shows the human side of what we do, right? And so we have baby showers for each other. We bring our dogs. Um, we're real human beings. I 
when I was in special session, I brought my kid because he was remote learning and he can be at school and my husband was traveling. Um, and so I think what is surprising for many people is how real of human beings we are and how accessible we are. And we're not that hard to talk to. We're not that hard to get a hold of. And we encourage everyone to get a hold of us. Um, the side conversations. So I always tell everyone in committee that there's three conversations going on at once. So there's the text conversation that you're having with other committee members and lobbyists. And if you're part of the public that has my number, I'll text you. There's also the Twitter conversation, which matters because that's where all the reporters are. And then you have the actual conversation in the room. Um, so there are tons of conversations. And when you're in committee, there really is three conversations going on. And if you're an advocate, you should try to participate in all three conversations because you'll be a better advocate for that. So those are my two things. There's always a lot of conversations and we are real human beings dealing with remote learning and dogs just like everyone else. Yeah, these are these made me laugh. These are really great. Um, Regina, I, I'm totally with you with the what is going on? This chaos on the floor, right? I wasn't ready for it. I was I was very much the good student in class, right? That like listened to the teacher. I was just like, what do we got to do next? And the number of conversations happening at once. I actually love the energy and I've missed it over the last few uh, months, but uh, that caught me off guard. Uh, sort of the the the, num the number of things that are happening at once. Uh, and so following those conversations has been certainly a learning curve. I'd say the, the, um, the other part of this that is interesting um, and it's just been eye-opening, it has been, I think it really hit me that I won, not in November after the election, but in December, when I came home after uh, spending a few weeks out of town and there was just hundreds of Christmas cards at my house uh, from people in the community, from folks, a lot of people that I know, organizations, lobbyists, of course, but just like there was just all of a sudden folks who I couldn't get to email me back all of a sudden were, were very much uh, excited to call me representative. Also the respect for the office in general, friends and people I know in the community who now are really relishing calling me representative. You know, it, it's still sort of an adjustment I have to make, right? Because uh, for me, I'm always, you know, I will always be an organizer at heart, someone, you know, from the community that is really there to work on behalf of the community. Uh, but folks just have a very different relationships with, with their representatives, I guess. And so I think that has been an adjustment where folks feel like they have to be all proper when they come meet me and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's still just me, right? This is Ricky, right? Like, let's talk about what's going on. And so... Uh, I think that's an interesting sort of uh, journey that, that I'm currently navigating as well. It's fantastic. And I, I love all of these examples because, you know, as, as you said, Faith, it, it humanizes the role, right? You are people, you are colleagues, you are friends, um, and, uh, and the work that you're doing is, um, is, it touches everyone's life in your state and across the country, but you're also people, right? Your, your moms, your dads, your sisters and brothers and wives and all of the rest. So, um, so that's, that's all incredible. And, and I, I see from the, the chat that everybody, um, it, you know, the stories are so funny and also so real. Um, so we have a few minutes for Q and A and we've gotten some great questions. One question that um, uh, applies, I think, to everyone, so feel free to, to hop in, is do, how many staffers do you actually have? And um, is it the same for Republicans and Democrats, or uh, does the majority party get more staff? So I get one part-time aide that is paid less than $15 an hour. And I keep trying to get them above $15 an hour because that's what we believe in. Um, and the majority party gets a little bit more money for partisan staff. So at the president, so I have a Senate president and a Senate majority leader, and they each get two staffers. The minority leader gets two staffers. So we get, essentially one extra staffer, I think, but they are shared amongst the entire caucus and the minority caucus is smaller. Um, but it's a real problem because I vote on over 500 bills a year and I have one part-time staffer. One of the things I'm most proud about is I've never had an aide for more than two years. 
Uh, so I train my AEs and connect them and make sure that they get placed in the progressive movement. So my aides are now working for Sierra Club and Conservation Colorado and Healthier Colorado and all these other organizations because they shouldn't be making minimum wage working for me. Um, and so I actually intentionally do that, but voting on over 500 bills a year and not having full-time staff and I work other jobs. So I make less than $40,000 a year as a state senator and we're mid-range in Colorado. Like I think the other colleagues on my call make less than me. Um, and that's not enough to pay my mortgage or daycare. And so I work other jobs. So I have one part-time staffer and work other jobs. And one of the things that we have to do if we care about diversity in office is start talking about paying our elected officials because we need living wages. And if you want people of color and young folks and GLBTQ folks to run for office, then we actually have to make a living wage. And the hardest part of my job is doing my side hustle contracts with nonprofits to feed my children. And that's a reality. So we as a country have to start talking about that. So in terms of staffers, um, the the legislators on, we, we get a full-time admin assistant from the state, but that full-time admin works for um, seven other legislators in my office. So he has a staff of eight legislators that he has to um, work for, but I was able to hire uh, my own legis legislative aide and also someone to handle my constituent services, which helps um, you know, me stay in contact with the community. And Faith, you're talking about less than 40, I can say less than 18 where we're at. We're, we're actually at 15 right now. And I think in, Ju in June, it's gonna go to 17. But yeah, that, that's where we're at as state legislators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I got y'all beat, don't worry. <laughs> 13 9 in North Carolina. And so it's it's wow. pretty abysmal. It's pretty abysmal. I think that's one of the biggest challenges, right? I think that's the, I knew the reality, right? Um, but I, back to your last question, right? Well, surprising. I mean, how do you juggle two jobs, right? I mean, this institution was created for a certain type of person, right? And it's very clear being on the other side of it where you're trying to answer work emails and in, in between votes. Uh, it, it's pretty, uh, eye-opening to, to say the least. Um, as far as staffing goes, our, our legislative aides at least get paid, you know, a bit better than we do. They are full-time. I get one um, and, you know, they, they get health benefits and everything. And so they, they are at least taken care of in that respect. I think it's actually a really great starting gig for younger people wanting to get involved in politics and in progressive movements in general. So my aide is 23 years old uh, and she's doing a fantastic job. And so I like that idea of faith of sort of training them up to make sure they move on to the next thing. And so um, I think that's certainly part of part of my vision as well. The majority party does get more staff. And I think right now on the hall that I'm at, it's three Democratic um, legislators and then the next three doors are political, political uh, senior aides for the majority speaker. And so, um, yeah, they certainly have more people power than we do. And I think that's sort of the, the way things have always operated in North Carolina. Yeah, and just looking at the comments in the chat and folks are alarmed and shocked. Uh, and it's really a very important issue. Um, and, you know, the point that Faith made about, you know, want, if we want to be serious about representation and building a reflective democracy, we need to pay a living wage to the people who are making the most important decisions in our states so that it's not just the rich. Uh, and and powerful who can afford literally to be in these positions. Um, and so, you know, it's an incredibly important issue to raise up. Um, one other question that, um, that came through is also uh, is related to how things work in the state in the state house, which is committee assignments. How, how does it work, especially for new folks who are just coming in? Um, do you get to choose? Is it is it political? I mean, always political, but is it is it competitive? How does how does that work, or is it just something you find out? You get an email. You're on these committees. Um, would be super curious for for insights there. 
So for um, my state, you do get a, a form asking what your preferences are. However, it's entirely up to the speaker to grant those preferences or not. Entirely up to, to the speaker. So um, I was able, he gave me one of the ones that I requested, um, but the other ones were pretty good also. Um, people are very surprised that me as a freshman got the committees that um, I was assigned to. So I'm, I'm not complaining. Yeah. Um, yeah, here in North Carolina, it's a similar process. Um, we got a form, a Google form to express our interests. Um, when I asked, you know, how seriously to take this form, I got some good chuckles and giggles from my fellow legislators or said they, they don't really take that into consideration. It's really up to uh, the, the will of the speaker and, and where they put you. Something that was, is just so frustrating, but I, I knew was a reality was I was having this conversation with the deputy leader um, in, our, in our caucus a few days ago. And she said, uh, expertise in a subject area is, is the last consideration on where you're assigned to committees. And so if they know you are a community college sort of administrator or have expert background in college access or the environment, they're not going to give you the opportunity to really shine. Um, and, and so they're definitely not going to put you on that committee. And so it's just really backwards thinking when, it talk, when you, you're thinking about what that means for the sorts of legislation we're producing to, to really find solutions to our problems. Um, so I would actually say in Colorado, it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, so the speaker in the House and the majority leader in the Senate choose what committee you're on. Um, but they actually do work really hard to make sure folks in hard districts get to do good committees because we have a very fragile trifecta in Colorado and we have to protect it. So when you look at the Fab Five that flipped the Senate, I'm the chair of transportation. Uh, there's a vice chair of business, a vice chair of education, the chair of finance and the chair of ag. And those are the Fab Five, right? And so our Senate is looking at how do we protect those that are in hard positions to make sure they're doing the work that they need to do to protect our majority. Um, and I think that's really important and that's, that's really good. So I'm chair of transportation and energy, which is interesting because I speak on a lot of panels nationally about transportation and shockingly, there's not a lot of women that are chairs of transportation. Um, so I'm always the token woman. <laughs> that gets to speak on these panels. And it's great, right? Because transportation is actually a progressive issue. It's how seniors get to their doctor's appointments and we can address climate change. And it's how workers get to their jobs. And I see it as a really progressive issue. And there's actually a New York Times article about Pete Buttigieg today that's transportation funding out about it. But that's what I'm doing, right? I'm going to do transportation funding this year and my leadership made sure that I get to step up and do that. And so we're working really hard to make sure that we're protecting those in hard seats. Yeah, um, it's so interesting. And again, one of the great things about this panel is the surprises that we're all learning in terms of um, how the you know sausage gets made. That's a common political trope, but, but also the politics involved between the majority and the minority for things like committee assignments and things like that, um, which, you know, is, is um, the kind of behind the scenes stuff that is, is just absolutely fascinating and honestly really inspiring to all of us as we look to do this work and um, commit to helping elect folks like you and reelect you all and, um, and, and do all of this knowing everything that you're going through and and the sacrifices and the insp inspiring experiences that you're having. Um, so one last question, and then this really is the last question, is about mentorship and um, and and sort of inspiring uh, ins inspiring you to to run and to do this work. Regina, you mentioned, of course, that you you ran once and um, came so close, and then you decided to run again. Would be so curious what uh, what inspired you. And I know we've chatted about this a little bit because we're 
we're, we're starting a, a new program um, called Future Winners, where we're going to be working to help uh, folks who came close and, and who should run again. But would be so curious, Regina, for your experience um, deciding to run again and um, and what what inspired you to, to take the take that jump again? Uh, aside from knowing that um, how close I came before, that told me that the community um, wanted a choice. And then people saying to me, don't give up. You know, um, you came this close. You normally don't win the first time around. And me still wanting to be an advocate for the people in the community, knowing that they needed someone else who was involved in the community, someone who listens to what's going on in the community. Um, I just wanted to try it one more time. And um, I'm glad I did. Absolutely. And Faith and Ricky, so curious um, if there were mentors along the way for you. I know Faith in particular, you've worked so tirelessly to help other women run and succeed. Um, and, you know, just curious for, for each of your thoughts about, um, you know, how important that sort of mentorship is and, um, and how inspiring it was, it might have been for you. Absolutely. So um, I mentioned I'm an organizer. And in 2004, I'd bring a lot of college students to the Capitol to lobby on clean energy. And that's when I met Joan Fitzgerald, who was the first woman president of the Senate in Colorado. And one day I asked her how she was so good at her job. And she said, we're only as good as the people that we have on our team. And politics is a team sport. And we need better people to run for office and you should run. And so she looked at me when I was 25 and believed in me. And since then, I work for the White House Project. I currently work for Vote Run Lead. I was the founding executive director of Emerge Colorado. And I know that women and people of color and GLTPQ folks have to be recruited to run for office. 70% of white men wake up and look in the mirror and they're like, sure, I can do this. That makes sense. And 70% of marginalized communities never believe they can. Um, and so I am working very hard to issue that invitation in the thousands, right? I want to invite all the women, all the people of color, all the GLBQT folks to run for office because, and MIT actually did a study that showed if women apply for a job and there's 10 qualifications, they won't apply until they have seven of the qualifications and men will apply when they have three. And so when you look at running for office and I'm voting on 500 bills a year, I'm gonna think I'm not qualified, right? And I'm gonna say, well, I don't know enough but about Tabor or taxes or potholes or whatever the thing is. Um, so I'm working really hard to issue that invitation um, if you know anyone, especially women that want to run for office, please send them to Vote Run Lead. We have a really good training program. I would love for you to send them there. Um, and I also regularly share that I still have imposter syndrome, right? I've been elected for 15 years. I have a black badge in the Capitol that says state senator. I've been caucus chair. I'm in leadership. And I walk into rooms and don't think I belong. And so let's all support each other in actually lifting each other's voices and being there. Uh, good stuff, good stuff. I, I learned some stuff too. This was a great panel. Um, I think for me, in terms of mentorship, uh, it's been a it's been a rocky journey, if I'm being honest, because young people of color are rarely recruited to run in competitive races in North Carolina. I mean, I guess nationally, right? But that is I was not, the red carpet not, was not rolled out for me, right? I forced myself into the conversation and with the support of groups like Sister District, made sure that we rose to the top. By the end of our cycle, um, you know, we were able to receive enough support from groups where I didn't get a dime from the Democratic Party. Uh, I mean, just mathematically, right? It, it just worked out that way. But that also gave me some autonomy, right? To really run the race that we needed to run. I'd say I had two sorts of mentors in this journey and I still do, right? I had like the... The person that was in my corner that was, you know, would always tell me, regardless of the reality, right, that it's me against the world and you're going to do this. It's always been you. 
uh, you know, just to really hype you up. Uh, and, you know, some days you just need that uh, sort of um, support in this journey. I think the other mentors that I had on this journey and still do are sort of the truth tellers, right? Just like, all right, how are we really going to face the realities of, you know, what it means to be young and a person of color in North Carolina? And how do we navigate this complicated political reality? And so I think both of those have really supported me. But at large, I think that it's really been women who have helped pave the way for me. It's, you know, it's been women who knows the challenges of what it means to serve in the General Assembly in North Carolina, what it means to be doubted and, and, and disrespected and all these things, right? And so it's, it's, I've looked to them and I continue to look to them um, for mentorship because they're the ones that always give me the best advice. And so I'm, I'm grateful for some of the incredible women we have in the General Assembly because they're the ones that help me feel like I certainly belong here and we're certainly going to continue to fight for a new day in North Carolina. Thank you so much. And it's, you know, we, we all um, uh, have experiences that might be somewhat similar, but hearing yours adds just this beautiful context to what we all experience, um, you know, imposter syndrome, uh, not being recruited, not being asked, having to force our way into conversations. Um, and, you know, it's, it is uh, what we are fighting against here at Sister District. What, what we're fighting for is, is a more reflective democracy um, that looks like our country and that has the experiences that we all share. And so um, I, I am, incredibly grateful to each of you for your service. You are the reason why we do this work at Sister District. We literally exist to help you succeed and win. Um, and, and hearing the grace and the bravery that you are all exhibiting in this very fraught and bizarre and strange moment in session and in this moment um, is just an absolute inspiration. And I hope you've been able to see some of the incredible love pouring out for each of you in our chat. Um, uh, you are all completely beloved here and um, we feel so invested in your success and, um, and are so excited about everything that will be to come. And I personally feel this is such an inspiring way to end our programming today um, in thinking about the ways in which we're all in this together um, and building each other up and we're all really in it for the long haul. So, um, so thank you so much. And now I'll, I'll turn things back to Rita to close us out for the day. And thank you so much again to our panelists.